Hello, this is Robert Rickover at Body Learning, and today my guest is Daniel Hearn, who's a pianist, guitarist, songwriter, and music teacher from Atlanta, Georgia, and he's in his third year of training to become an Alexander Technique teacher. It is a three-year process, typically. Originally, Daniel was drawn to the technique uh, as a way to relieve back pain and improve performance, but he has broadened his interest to investigating how it relates to topics such as autonomy and mental health. And it's the mental health uh, part of that that we are going to be talking about today. This is the a second part of a two-part two, uh, two part podcast on the general topic how the Alexander Technique can help uh, people suffering mental health issues. And the first part, we talked sort of very generally and focusing on breathing and how the technique can help with breathing and how that in turn can have beneficial effects beyond just the the, uh, intake and outtake of of air. But we're going to get into more technical stuff uh, on this podcast. podcast. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you uh, for for being on the show. And before we get into all this technical stuff, maybe you could give our listeners just a short description of what the what the Alexander technique is. Uh, I'd say the Alexander technique is a way of I'll just use the one I used last time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> using using uh, your knowledge of um, basic laws of physics and how your body works to improve the way you function. But I will add that you do have to keep in mind that you might not be doing with your body what you think you are. You're almost certainly not doing with your body what you think yes. it is. <laughs> uh, it, it would be very unusual if you were. Um, that's one of Alexander's great discoveries that most of us have no idea or have faulty uh, information about that. Um, so uh, so the, the technique, as, as we said in the last uh, podcast, you know, it's generally known for helping performers and musicians, actors, dancers, people like that to, to do better at what they're doing. And it's also pretty well known for helping with pain, back pain, neck pain, that kind of thing. It's not generally thought of as a solution to mental health issues. Now, I think you gave a pretty good um, explanation in the first podcast. Maybe you could just sum up very briefly in a sentence or two before we get on to the more detailed stuff about that connection between breathing, which the Alexander Technique certainly can improve the quality of breathing, and um, mental health, and then we could go into more of the the deeper stuff. Does that, okay. s- does that sound like a good plan? Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, the, the brief summary of the last podcast is by extending your exhalations, the the length of your exhalations, you are um, lowering your heart rate and exercising the part of your nervous system that's involved in social engagement, which is um, not fight or flight or freeze, which is where you Im- want to be yeah. unless someone's attacking you. <laughs> right, right. And... And it's more than just deliberately extending the length of your exhalations, which a lot of people are now. It's become a bit of a buzz phrase now that you want to have more. You want your exhalations to be longer than your inhalations, um, and it's not. It's that is a good idea, but the Alexander technique um, kind of brings that about organically. You might want to nudge it a bit. But the the tech generally with the technique that is what's going to happen at least in my experience and people I've seen. So 
we've talked about that and now I think you want to talk about some more technical stuff so yes so uh, bear with me this is this is going to be leaning more towards uh, this theory put forth called the polyvagal theory by Stephen Porges and how it relates to Alexander okay so um, a lot of AT teachers will talk about um, fight flight and freeze and uh, there's a Alexander jargon word called inhibition which is essentially the idea that you can stop and choose a different response to mm -hmm. something that's happening to you Mm -hmm. That's that's one definition of it. There are many. Right, <laughs> um, there. Um, and uh, I, I got interested in this because from my understanding of psychology and biology, this isn't 100% true. Uh, if, if someone were to attack you or rob you or, you know, try to gut you with a knife, your heart rate would go up and you couldn't really – choose that um, <laughs> you couldn't choose to, to slow it down at that you point. couldn't you couldn't choose to slow it down at that point and there, there's um, some question about whether it would even be a good idea to slow it down right y yes yes so uh, that's that's the idea the polyvagal theory takes a look at um, evolution mm -hmm. and how certain responses were in fact beneficial to ensure survival so um, you're more likely to survive if you are actually basically monitoring the environment for risk. If you have a bias towards thinking you're going into danger. So um, there's this idea there called neuroception. So, uh, you know, in Alexander Technique, we talk about extended field of awareness sometimes is, mm -hmm. is uh, one of the teaching methods. Um, neuroception is a term that is given to something your body or your nervous system is doing all the time, which is looking around and deciding whether you are uh, one of three things, and those th three things are safe, in danger, or basically about to die. Um, <laughs> we're getting which more of it which here. could be considered <laughs> a little dangerous too, right? <laughs> yes, which could be which could be considered dangerous too. Right. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is it's uh, it's not objective. Is in um, the way it relates to mental health, for example, is you've got uh, people with PTSD or social anxiety, uh, various things where someone is in a room with other human beings, and there's nothing that in that environment you could really rationally say is going to injure someone or cause them harm. Mm -hmm. But uh, because of the history of some individual's experience or, you know, we, we, there's all kinds of theoretical reasons for it. I personally think it's usually due to a history of a person's experience. They may be unable to feel safe even though an environment is safe. Right. And that, uh, that feeling unsafe uh, could come on very suddenly, right? Yes. Shocking everyone in the room. Shocking, right. shocking everyone in the room, and not necessarily something you uh, have a choice about. You, right. It's like uh, you catch yourself um, acting out afterwards. Right. So, um, this this idea of neuroception is kind of essential to understanding this. So um, each each neuroception, so you've got safety, danger, and life threat, are associated with different behavioral responses. So safety, um, if you're safe, you're open to social engagement like we are now. Um, so an example of a safe environment or neuroception would be if you were with a trusted friend and you were cooking dinner and you were uh, you know um, confident enough in this person's decency and your tolerance of each other that you could be close to each other mm -hmm. um, so that's 
that's one response is social engagement and you can talk you can listen uh i'm i'm going to may i go into the weeds <laughs> yeah sure okay we're gonna go into the weeds okay so um not only are these responses differently uh, y they you observe them differently they're also carried out by different parts of the autonomic nervous system so uh when someone feels safe and they're uh, open to social engagement. Uh, this is carried out by a, a kind of network of nerves, and this network of nerves links the muscles in your face, like the muscles of facial expression, uh, the muscles involved with chewing, the muscles involved with vocalization, particularly your larynx and pharynx, which is just the word larynx may pop out to Alexander people. Mm -hmm. um, it links that to your heart rate and so what happens is when you feel safe and open to social engagement or you perceive your, that the environment is safe your heart rate is reduced so that you can uh, calm down and talk to people and listen to them so the, the, e the muscles in your ears tense to help make it possible to hear human voices instead of you know air conditioners rumbling mm -hmm. uh, and you're able to maintain eye contact so for example you don't look at people who are you're massively un uncomfortable with. <laughs> um, so that is what happens uh, if you feel safe right mm -hmm. so um, we'd say a healthy individual feels safe when they are safe and feels threatened when they are threatened right okay Mm -hmm. um, so this social engagement idea is accompanied by prolonging your exhalations because what are you doing when you're talking and someone is listening to you you are prolonging your exhalations you have a diaphragm it's pushing air out of you and you're um, you're making long exhalations because that's what's required to speak and mm -hmm. so your heart rate goes down so we've got this one response that people engage in, it's social engagement. Um, so now if your nervous system says to you, uh-oh, I'm in danger, uh, there's someone attacking me, so I've been physically assaulted before, it's not fun, uh, what happens is a branch of your nervous system called the sympathetic comes on, the sympathetic nervous system, and what it does is it pumps blood to your skeletal muscles, so like your legs and, and your arms and uh, the things involved in moving, so you can either run away or fight, so your fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And it takes blood away from your stomach, like uh, things involved in digestion, because it is not advantageous to break down a burrito inside your stomach when the energy doing that could be Mm -hmm. diverted to escaping from something that's immediately life-threatening right um yeah so the interesting thing is that social engagement is not compatible with fight or flight like the body cannot do both or one both at once mm -hmm. right and yes yeah and social engagement is also uh, a state that you're in when um, you are in fact able to digest, uh, you're able to uh, be calm enough to go to sleep and have other basic processes that go on in your body. Homeostasis is the fancy biological word for it that maintain your health when uh, nothing bad is happening. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we've got two responses so far. We've got social engagement when you're safe and we have fight or flight when you feel like you're in danger. Mm -hmm. um, the third one, freeze, is, uh, well, I'll, I'll give an example of fight or flight. So uh, if you've ever been physically assaulted by someone, you don't try and talk them out of it, you run. <laughs> right. uh, so so uh, there's, there's no potential for, you know, things people like to do like learning from each other or right, right. <laughs> hugging <laughs> right. um, so that uh, 
is incompatible with social engagement and homeostasis. Uh, the third one, freeze, happens when you feel like a threat is inescapable. Um, now, this is this is something that mammals can do, but it's well, I don't I actually don't need to go into that. Reptiles also freeze. We evolved long, long, long ago from reptiles, and we have the we have we still have the same potential responses. Mm -hmm. So. Um, when you feel like you can't escape, what happens is this nerve called the vagus. Now, in the last podcast, we talked about the myelinated vagus. The myelinated vagus is different from the reptilian vagus. So one slows heart rate to make social engagement possible. Mm -hmm. The other slows heart rate to make you immobile, uh, playing possum, for example, uh, freeze, death feigning, and... Um, a cessation of breathing, like when uh, a turtle goes underwater. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, and it's, sorry to bring it down to earth. An example of this, uh, personally, is I was at the dentist a few months ago, and uh, it was a dental college, so <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. cheaper. Right. Um, and and I uh, didn't trust the person numbing me, mm -hmm. and so. Um, I, I basically convinced myself that, you know, I started to get nervous that I was going to feel the drill in my tooth, mm -hmm. but I was paying for the operation. I didn't want to make another trip out there. So I made myself sit in the chair and put up with it anyway. Well, I passed out. <laughs> so, uh, that passing out would be a function of freeze. Right. Right. So. These things happen in a hierarchical fashion. They're not all a hierarchical fashion. They're not all going on at the same time. It's like one response is tried. If it fails, the uh, more evolutionary primitive response happens and so on. So uh, as mammals, our most recent evolutionary, evolutionary response to threat is social engagement. Mm -hmm. Um and it's it's not really a response to threat actually it's it's something we do when we're safe but when we're unsafe we revert to fight or flight and when we're not in fight or flight if if we're really perceiving that we're in danger we'll go into freeze uh so those are the three ideas and basically um the concept of how this can help people with mental health is that mental illness is sometimes characterized by an inability to um, socially engage mm -hmm. so someone is stuck in fight or flight or stuck in freeze and they're unable to um, come out of that when they perceive safe things it's like um, uh, you have two people one is in a state of social engagement like they're they're breathing they feel safe the other is twisted and distorted and tight and not breathing much at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, you you take a flower and you show it to both of them and you say, this is a flower. And one of them says, oh, great, a flower. And the other one goes, I hate everything. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, it's not a choice. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's a – I well, not to get it – I like to believe in choice. But um, uh, it's – it's not always something that person can it's it's a result of what their body is telling them not a result of the thing that's external so right. alexander technique um by number one making it possible to extend your inhalations by helping you deal with i guess the the mechanical aspects of that mm -hmm. and uh correspondingly helping you with your your voice so i mean we have alexander he was depressing his larynx he was tightening his neck he was pulling his head back and down well the nerves that are involved with the social engagement system connect directly to the larynx and the pharynx um to the platysma which is this big muscle on your neck that moves your around uh, to the eyes and the ears and 
the things involved in gesturing. Mm-hmm. So it's it's uh it's it's curiously kind of related to you know people will say primary control is the head and neck relationship. I personally don't think primary control is the head and neck. It's it's a complicated thing, mm-hmm. but uh, it is interesting to know that um, all those muscles that we're putting our hands on, um, if if you're a, doing a hands-on teaching approach. Mm-hmm. And you go and you place your hands on someone's head are involved in the social engagement system. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, so just there, um, to to pause yeah. for a second, that yeah. term primary control is the phrase that Alexander used to describe the sort of the quality of the head neck relationship, and he felt that that quality the ease of movement of your head on top of the of your spine was kind of the key to everything and that's why he called it primary control i think these days there are a lot of teachers who would um, take issue with that to one extent or another but for sure it's an important intervention point for alexander Mm -hmm. teachers even if you don't label it primary control so just yes. to, to clarify that a little bit. So okay, so Alexander, a, a, the normal process of of a Alexander lesson, if we could say there is such a thing, it's not entirely clear that's the case. But typically, <laughs> typically, in an Alexander lesson, uh, uh, you're, there's going to be a lot of attention paid to that area of your body, head, neck, upper torso. And you're saying that that is precisely the area that is um, linked with the one of those two systems with the the, the fight or flight one, or I'm, I'm uh, not the sure. social engagement. The social engagement. So, so right. when when people are safe, their voices are functioning, uh, their neck and head are not being pulled back and down. Um, mm-hmm. Their their ears are working. They're not having excess jaw tension. Right, uh, right. Because excess jaw tension doesn't let you talk. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 associated with social engagement, which is associated with perceiving that the environment is safe. So it does. Uh, if um, those effects come about from the um, the freedom of that area is the sort of social engagement network but if a person is in the fight or flight mode perhaps from PTSD who knows and an Alexander teacher helps them to release that um, it may be that that release will have to be done more gradually or more thoughtfully than you might normally expect because you can't just go in there and free up everything with the person still having the underlying condition, right? Uh, yes. That, that and could be a little dangerous. For Yeah. I mean, There's I, also that yeah. it might be free during the lesson but not free outside of the lesson. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and it yeah. may be that, I mean, just from the point of view of Alexander teachers who are listening to this, I mean, we've all had students of varying degree of ability to absorb the basic ideas of the technique, either through hands-on or verbal instruction. And one of the reasons why someone might not seem to be doing as well as others could be some of this fight-or-flight stuff being there. It doesn't have to be full-fledged PTSD. It just means it could mean someone who's um, a little nervous about someone putting their hands yeah. on on their neck, you know, yes. that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But on the other um, hand, to the extent that you can help people release that, or at least give them the choice of being learning how to release it on their own at the pace they want to, then that does that I would think could certainly help in moving out of that PTSD mode. Yes, uh, I, I do want to. I, I, I want to come back to something though because I think I, I said something that like may have uh, misconstrued my meaning. Okay. Um, 
I'm I'm interested in the uh the the fact that all those muscles that people talk about in primary control are related to the social engagement system, but I'm I'm much more interested in breathing in the torso. Mm-hmm. Um so there there were really like I'm I'm going to throw quotes now. <laughs> there were two things in this book. One was that that, that that struck me, and one was so these these uh, if you can recover the functioning of someone's larynx, pharynx, muscles of their face and head and neck, you will also see a improvement in heart rate variability, which we talked about in the last podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was that. Um, and then there's that in Alexander's books when he's giving his kind of case histories of people, mm-hmm. much of the time he's talking about someone's jaw being over tightened or uh, all, all kinds of things also associated with these muscles. Um, but the other thing from the polyvagal theory is um, they're talking about extending exhalations and how – uh, playing flute, for example, uh, is an exercise that by extending your exhalations, it says this mechanical, this simple mechanical shift will, by extending exhalations, improve the functioning of the social engagement system. So it will get you out of fight or flight to extend your exhalations. Because if you're uh, playing the flute, you have to take yes. longer exhalations to do it, right? Yes. To have enough air, enough fresh air to actually play the fruit, flute. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, um, although I think in Alexander lessons, someone may recover the functioning of their neck, head, uh, face, and facial expression muscles, and voice, I see that as a result of um, coordinating the torso. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think Alexander would disagree with you on that, or okay. e- or even most Alexander teachers. I mean, it is all interconnected, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, we're getting a little short on time. Does this does yeah. this cover? I mean, have you covered the basic ideas that you want to cover? The more in the weeds type stuff. Yeah. On this topic? So, uh, if I can just give a brief recap. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So um, basically, humans have three responses that are available to them: social engagement, fight or flight, and freeze. These are the three generalized categories that Mm -hmm. our nervous system is capable of. And um, many mental health issues are associated with uh, having inappropriate responses. So either acting like you're threatened when you're really not Mm -hmm. or acting like you're safe when someone is threatening you. Mm -hmm. And that in the case of the first one where you feel threatened when you're not, Alexander Technique by uh, teaching you the the me- mechanics involved and the self-observation skills involved in improving your breathing and the, the conditions that your breathing is going to happen in. Oh, jeez, I'm trailing on. Okay. Um, by, by improving the... Uh, by improving your breathing can make you more likely to perceive safety when there is safety instead of divert like um habitually going into fight or flight and, and, that and maybe more can, more generally yeah, just well. just give you a, more generally give you a more accurate picture of what your current reality is yes right okay and was there another thing you wanted to say or uh, uh you, no i think that's it all right that, that covers all the bases. Okay. So um, this has been part two of a two-part, two-podcast series, you might say, on this general topic of the Alexander Technique and 
mental health. My my guest has been Daniel Hearn, and uh, thank you, Daniel, so much for being on the show. Thank you, Robert. All right.